Well, hello folks, and welcome to another episode of the RetroPower Autofocus series. You'll have realized it's been an awfully long time since the last one that we did, which we've just, uh, I've just scratched my memory bank and uh, J Jamie's just reminded me was uh, regarding jigs and what we use them for and why we use them. I've decided that the next episode that we're going to do is going to be on metal shaping. Now, there's various things I'm not going to talk about in this episode. I'm not going to talk about how, cutting the basics of cutting metal. We've covered this in various other videos I've done in the past. The cutting, the folding, you know, using a normal folder to put 90 degree folds in bits of metal, things like that. They're so basic that I don't think it's worth covering. And you know, any, anybody within anybody who's going to be interested in watching this video is probably already going to be at the stage where they know how to put a fold in a bit of metal and how to do the extreme basics of metal metal forming. I would I wouldn't have even call that shaping really. It's just putting putting basic forms into a piece of metal. What we are going to cover is generating compound curves and a few other interesting little areas which may not be totally apparent to somebody who's in the earlier stages of metalwork. The other thing I'm not going to cover is going into a great deal of detail on use of the English wheel. We're going to do a little bit, but there are many people much better qualified than me and probably much better qualified than anybody in this business in terms of how to use an English wheel and the, the, de the details involved in producing uh, panels for cars on an English wheel. It's a very complex subject based on an extremely simple principle. So we're going to cover the very simple principle and I'm hoping that will give you a bit of a background to it and take away some of the mystique because in my experience it's an area that's sort of shrouded in mystery um, and, it, and it needn't be. The actual fine use of this of, of an English wheel is very complicated and very detailed but the actual basic principle of it is extremely simple. So without further ado I'll progress on to, uh, to, to some of the, the basics of shaping. So when we want to make a panel for a car, say for example, uh, picking a car that's in our workshop at the moment, the, our, our, we, we've named the project Churchill, the Mark II Jaguar two-door coupe that we're making. Stu's been making a lot of panels for that. And uh, the principle of shaping is that we need to generate a compound curve in a sheet of flat steel that we start with. We need to generate a compound curve in it to a particular shape that might be pleasing to our eye or might be to conform to a particular design that's been generated by a car designer or somewhere even in between, which is the case of how it works here generally. Um, so in order to generate that curve, we have to put shape into the steel. Now obviously, a single curvature, you can just bend the piece of steel around something. It's simply bending it. That gen will generate a curve in one direction. To curve it in two directions, we have to stretch the steel. Uh, and there are a whole abundance of ways of doing that. Um, the gentle method of doing that for generating gentle compound curves is the English wheel. And this works on a very, very simple principle, which is that it stretches the material very much like a rolling pin with pastry. If you uh, have ever rolled out pastry, I'm using an analogy which I realize not everybody watching this might have ever rolled out a piece of pastry, but let's carry on with the analogy. As you roll out pastry, you make it thinner where you roll it and a piece of pastry gets bigger. Very simple principle. It's the same with a piece of steel. If you get a piece of steel and get a particularly strong, hard rolling pin and very strong arms and you roll it enough, it will get thinner and bigger. So you may think, well, how does that help me make a curved panel for a car? Well, the key is that if you somehow restrain that steel from getting bigger, it will then generate a curve in it. It will grow upwards or downwards and generate a curve if it's restrained from just getting big, a bigger, thinner sheet. And that's the principle we work on pretty much entirely through the whole metal shaping process. We rely on the principle of making metal thinner and bigger and therefore giving it what we would call crown or shape by making it grow in the upward or downward direction by restraining its perimeter as we, as we stretch that material. And that's the, that's the principle used throughout. Now, obviously, the Americans tend to favor use of a power hammer over the English wheel, which is fine. The Italians historically have used power hammers, maglio hammers, maglio uh, over the English wheel. Uh, they all work in a similar principle. You're stretching the material, but not all of it, so that you generate shape by restraining the periphery. So without further ado on that, I'm going to do a, a ho hopefully manage to do a very quick demonstration on the English wheel of the, the principle of how that works. 
Uh, I'll probably make a mess of it, but uniquely I've managed to not draw a frame on this in all directions. But here's a rectangle of some steel. I think it's uh, 18 gauge, 1.2 millimeter thick. I've drawn a little bit, there's a bit of a frame around it with one side missing because I forgot to put it that side. But basically, if we thin the material in the middle, towards the middle of this piece of uh, steel, it will try and grow in that direction and that in all directions radially it will try and grow if we don't thin the material around the edge it won't be able to grow past that as long as we leave a band of unthinned material around the edges wide enough to restrain that material in the middle from growing it has to go somewhere it can't not go anywhere so if it was very thin it might wrinkle up or do all sorts of horrible things in the middle but with a reasonable thickness what it will do is either come upwards or downwards ignore which direction it goes in for the minute that's not all that important it does go in a particular direction on a wheel just because of the nature of the wheels but it uh, but that's not overly important to the principle of what we're trying to achieve here so I put the uh, material into the wheel, ignore what the wheels are, it doesn't really matter for this particular job, and I wheel it backwards and forwards. I'm going to do it very slowly and very deliberately, just so you can see. So that was a piece of flat material I started with there. Probably should have shown you slightly better how flat it was. But I'm going to do this, but I'm not going to go right to the edge. And as I go, it will stretch only very slightly, but it will flatten the material, crush it between the two rollers, spread it like a piece of pastry and a rolling pin, and then that material won't be able to go anywhere because I've left a bit round the edge that restrains it, and consequently it will bow the middle of the sheet and generate some compound curvature in it. And that's the entire principle of wheeling. So if I now show you that, you'll be able to see there's a very, very slight curve in both directions in it. Not huge, but there is a very slight curve in both directions. So what I'll do is do that again and generate a little bit more. Just put a little bit more curvature into it, just so you can see the general principle. I haven't got a huge amount of pressure on here, so it's not gonna put an enormous amount of curvature in, and it's fairly thick material, so it takes a little bit of working to generate that curve. But you'll see the principle, and you'll also see that in my cumbersome hands, it's not a particularly fast process. But it's just to, gener just to explain the principle of what you'll see when Stu is making the panels for the Jaguar, how, how, those, how those panels become curved. As you can see now, it's gaining a degree more curvature. Um, it's re reasonably obvious now that that's becoming fairly curved in two directions. So that is a compound curve, and that panel is now surprisingly strong. I now can't bend that panel in either direction. That's now completely rigid, and that curvature has put a huge amount of strength into that panel. So that's the principle of working of the English wheel. Basically, take a section of steel, compress it between two rollers, that spreads the material outwards, and then you leave material around the edge, which is not compressed, that restrains the material, it has to go in one direction, so it either goes upwards or downwards. And that's all there is to an English wheel. That's absolutely it. Forget any level of mystique or any mystery and black magic. All it does is squeeze steel and spread it and generate a curve via making that material go somewhere that it wouldn't otherwise go. So that's the entire, the, 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 all the rollers have a totally different purpose, which is almost irrelevant to this. The radius is, a, the radii of curvature of the rollers is simply to be able to get them in. When you've shaped a panel, it may have some curvature that's very difficult to access, uh, and you wouldn't be able to get in with a roller of that size because it's too flat to fit into the curve underneath. So that's why you would use the other rollers. And basically, you always use the flattest roll that will go into the space available because the flatter roller is easier to use. It's easier to not make a mess of the job, basically, when using a flatter roller. But the principle is the same. You roll the steel, it grows, it generates curvature. Simple as that. So that's, that's one area. That's stretching material using English wheel. We can also stretch material using a hammer. Uh, and again, very, very simple. There's a couple of ways of doing it. We can stretch it onto a hard surface, like an anvil with a hammer, or we can stretch it into a sandbag, um, also using a hammer. On the sandbag, you basically stretch the material over the head of the hammer by making an impression into it, and that stretches the material, sort of extrudes it over the head of the hammer. If you do it on, a, on a, an anvil, which I'll demonstrate in a sec, it does the same as the English wheel, and you're pinching the material between two hard surfaces, spreading it, and again, making the crown increase. Um, I could demonstrate that very quickly over on this anvil. I'm going to make Jamie reverse a few times during this video, but I'll demonstrate it very quickly on this, quickly and slightly noisily, but I will demonstrate it very quickly on this. 
So I'll use a hammer with a gently curved face here, and what we can do is raise the section in the middle of this. Doing this quite crudely and quite harshly just to demonstrate it very quickly with a minimum of fuss uh, and as you can see that's now raised another section in the middle of that uh, piece just by thinning it again between a hammer and an anvil spread the material the material has to go somewhere it tries to spread sideways can't spread sideways because it's restrained by all this so it goes upwards and obviously because I happen to be hitting it downwards that's the direction it went in it didn't come up towards my hammer if the anvil could hit upwards and I held the hammer still the reverse would happen it would come upwards that's purely the direction of the application of the force it's nothing to do the, the, the growth of material would be the same it just happens to be growing in the direction that the force with the impact was applied so as I say it's similar with the wheel it, it, it's because of the diameter of the rollers it's the roll rollers with the same diameter it would probably be a 50 50 guess as to which direction the steel would grow in but because the bottom the anvil roller the bottom roller is smaller on the English wheel that's the direction that material curves because it's more likely to curve over the smaller roller just because of the way the material deforms so that's the principle of stretching material using some form of crushing action i.e English wheel to pinch it, hammer and anvil to pinch it. I'm not going to demonstrate the sandbag, I was going to, but the reality is it's much the same process, only you're hitting it very hard with a round, with a much bigger curvature on the hammer. And again, it will stretch the material uh, into a dome shape, which you can then finish off in the English wheel. I'll just take this back over to the wheel now and quickly run this through the wheel to demonstrate the, uh, the effect of that. But equally, there will be lots of... Uh, footage of uh, Stu doing that on, on much more complex parts where it's a, a lot more obvious but if we, uh, we wind this up I can just quickly demonstrate the, the effect of that hammered area and this is going to be fairly crude quick and dirty run over this with the wheel just to just to demonstrate so that's that I'll do it the other way as well just so it spreads the curvature out in both directions but it's not that important really So that's smoothed that out and generally grown the whole area. So as you can see, we've added quite a lot more curvature through the combination of the two processes, the English wheel stretching a bit, the hammer stretching a bit, and then the two processes combining and blending to form a bit more curvature. As you can imagine, doing that to shape an entire wing on a car is a lot bigger job. But that's how, that's the same principle that Stu has used throughout to shape the panels on the Jaguar to give the crown that you see on the rear quarter panels, on the front corners of the front valance, uh, and even on the door skins. Now the door skins are almost flat and that's where you have to be very, very gentle and very careful with the wheel. And you only want to put a tiny amount of stretch in, very evenly distributed across the whole panel, just so that the whole panel has a very slight compound curvature. And that's where a, a lot of skill comes in because it's very, very difficult to apply that tiny amount of force over the entire panel very, very evenly and not get lumps and bumps in the panel. That's where, this, that's where the the second sort of layer of things comes in with the English wheel, which is the skill level required to generate panels that don't need too much work post wheeling. Um, but that's, you, you can now see the principle of hammer stretching, wheel stretching, and what that does to a piece of material. So what I'll show you is one other method of stretching, which is not for the shaping of a compound curve. I'm gonna make Jamie reverse again. But what I will do, and I'll show you another reason why we might stretch material. And that will tie me then into another process which I want to show you, which is the reverse of stretching. I folded a little uh, angled section of steel here, again, some 18 gauge I think it is, um, which I folded to uh, nearly 90 degrees, not quite. Another we way we can stretch material is to use a stretcher, funnily enough, a, a machine of some sort which is designed to clamp material and pull it apart. Uh, and we use that quite a bit when we're making uh, flanges for windows, uh, windscreen aperture or uh, rear window apertures on a car. We might use a stretcher in various places to shape those into a, to a third piece of curvature. You may have seen recently in some of our videos, Tom using a stretcher a bit, making the aluminium screen aperture formers that we used on the Jensen CV8. Um, he, he uses a, a stretching machine a little bit on those to, to, to generate the, the shape he wanted there. So what I'm going to do is quickly show you. This is a, a small stretcher, 
um, supplied by uh, stakes use metalwork machinery good little bit of equipment and I can demonstrate quite quickly I'm going to do this quite gently just to demonstrate a little bit obviously I should have shown first that's a straight piece before I start too much I've, I'll cover up in my hand the bit I've just uh, started on but in a few simple little pedal motions on there I can put in I'm not going to put much in because it's very rare that you actually need to stretch very far like this so I'll put a few pedal motions in but as you can see that's now putting a significant curvature in and that's working by stretching this edge thinning the material pulling it apart and these jaws here basically clamp the material on two sides and then pull it apart and that's the limitation of this type of machine is that all of the pull is quite concentrated into a small area so when you do that it has a tendency that it's quite possible to split the material the other way the other way of doing this and i'll quickly another quick aside just to make jenny's life difficult the other way of doing it is by using what we would call a directional stretch hammer which is a, a hammer with a, a curved end like that which so it concentrates the force quite well into a, a, a low, into a line and then what we can do is if we pick where we want to apply the stretch we can pick the hammer like that then incline the hammer slightly downwards to taper the force application towards the edge and then we can hit that like that and it will damage the edge but it does apply quite a lot of stretch and will put quite a lot of curvature in quite rapidly again I'm doing this I'm doing this in quite a, a malicious manner. You wouldn't normally do this this hard and make that much of a mess of the edge. But just to show you quite quickly, again, the alternative way of putting quite a lot of stretch into an edge with that, and, it, and it's much, it, much easier to not split the material than using a stretcher, using the hammer. But it obviously does put a lot of marks in that you then need to planish out. You could also use the English wheel to run along this edge and do exactly the same job, but it's just that your fingers are perilously close to the wheels normally, so you end up nipping your skin in there as well. So it's, uh, it's definitely nice to use the stretcher or the hammer sometimes. So anyway, at that point, I'm going to take a slight diversion off because what we've talked about so far is stretching material. Now, let's say... Uh, I'm just trying to think of a panel we've made fairly recently that would where we would run into this problem I think Stu probably ran into this quite a bit on the inner rear arch tubs for the Churchill Jaguar which is that you start with a material obviously of a finite thickness in the example of those I think they were 18 gauge so approximately 1.2 millimeters thick if we need to generate a huge amount of curvature in that material obviously we need to thin it a lot and it, it's entirely possible and regularly happens that we get to the point where the material gets to the minimum thickness that we would want to put on that car which let's say for the sake of argument in that area I wouldn't want the material to be thinner than say 0.8 millimeters something like that it's probably the thinnest I would want so we've got 0.4 millimeters let's say of material to play with to thin down uh, in order to stretch that panel and it's quite possible that if in trying to put a lot of shape into a panel that we could end up needing more than 0.4 millimeters of thickness um, to lose to generate that shape so what do we do if we, that's a finite point we start with a given thickness we've got to end with a, a given minimum thickness so what happens if we run out of material to thin to generate the shape well, what we need to do there is shrinking there are other reasons to shrink as well um, and I'm going to start with going back to this little tool because it's near here and it ties into what I was just doing with the stretcher and that will explain some of the principles we're going to go into but what we need to do on the, on the panel where we run out of the ability to stretch is the areas that we weren't stretching i.e. the edges of the panel that we weren't going to stretch because remember they're holding the panel back and they're what are generating that compound curvature we talked about what we need to do instead of just leaving them alone and letting them restrain the panel is make them restrain the panel more by making them smaller uh, and that's what we would do by shrinking. And if you're totally um, green to all this, you would think, well, how on earth do you make metal smaller? Well, it's very simple. You do the reverse of stretching it and you squeeze it and thicken it. And it's actually possible to get some metal, squeeze it together and actually make it thicker. And there are a number of ways of doing that. And while we just saw the little uh, Stakesy's uh, stretching device, I'll show you the same, but with a shrinker. So it's very simple. This has two jaws which clamp the material and squeeze it onto itself. So I'll do this. Now this material is quite thick. Um, so it's sort of, the machine's fairly on its limit. With 18 gauge at this sort of depth, it's quite on its limit. But I can show you this, the principle fairly readily here. As you can see, the curvature is taking place in the other direction now. 
and it's not too hard to imagine that you might be able to generate quite a curve here quite quickly. So as you can see now, the material's curving in the reverse direction because I'm making this side shorter. And as I make it shorter, the material gets thicker. Uh, and you, you, it's hard to tell when you're only shrinking a little bit, but when you shrink a lot, you can actually see a visible thickening of the material. So as it's going, going back to the example on the Churchill Jaguar, when Stu runs out of the ability to thin the material, to stretch, to, to form the shape that he needs, he can go to the edges of the panel he's making and shrink those, and that will then, break, that will then effectively give him more crown in the panel. Um, and what we would generally do when we start making a panel uh, with a lot of curvature, that we know is going to have a lot of curvature, we would start by shrinking the edges. Before we started doing the wheeling and hammering in the middle of the panel, we would initially start by shrinking it all around the edges to give ourselves a head start, if you like, on the shrinking operation. So what I'm going to do now is, Jamie can wait there, I am going to grab a piece of steel I might use this one actually that we just to demonstrate this more that this piece here it's a little bit uh, heavy for the job but this piece that we stretch the middle of what i'm going to do is use our really high power shrinker our pneumatic shrinker over here to demonstrate the uh, to demonstrate the idea of the fact that we we can increase the crown by reducing the length of the material around the edges um, it's been a little while since i've used this but we are we're plumbed in it's quite noisy so you'll have to pardon the uh, pardon the noise this has a lot of a lot of shrinking power, so I can demonstrate this quite quickly. Again, there'll be some footage of, of Stu using this much more adeptly on panels that are a bit more relevant than this little square I've got here. But, but it's very it's quite good to just see with a bit of an explanation at the same time. You can actually see the material move in on itself there. And it just shows the, the power of, uh, of this machine doing this. But it also demonstrates that the material is being thickened. Because it has nowhere to go, it's being crushed back in on itself. It's being, it's being thickened as we go. As you can see, I'm gaining crown quite rapidly here. It looks messy, but if we then wheeled that, that would all blend in. I'll give it a quick run down this side as well. You can see the material move in as those jaws squeeze on it. I'm not entirely sure of the forces involved, but I would have thought somewhere approaching 10 tonnes of force is being applied there, given the pressure and the size of the ram and the leverage ratio. So as, not to, so as not to bore everybody to death, I'll probably stop at that. But as you can see now, we've shrunk the material all the way around the edges, and that's gained us quite a lot more crown. So if, you, if, we, didn't, if we hadn't done that wheeling in the, in the centre at the beginning, we would still have all this shrink around the edge, and that gives us a head start. It means that for a given amount of crown, i.e. height of the centre above the edge, we've already gained quite a lot of we've already gained a good headway into that crown that we're trying to gain in the middle simply by shortening the edges so then if we wheel the center we can gain crown really rapidly without the material in the middle becoming too thin so that's the principle of uh, shrinking there's we can use the foot operated small mechanical shrinker over there or we have this one which i've converted to pneumatic power just for a lot more power there is another way of doing it um, which I'm going to uh, demonstrate very quickly, which is um, a stump uh, bowl. It's basically using the difference in grip between wood and a hammer to actually cause metal to shrink in on itself. So I'll demonstrate that very, very quickly now. And it'll probably go badly because it's a long time since I've done it. But I will try and give a very, very brief demonstration. For this, what we use is a, a very, very heavy bullet-nosed hammer, preferably one made of nylon so it doesn't put so much marking in. And the aim here 
is to hit the material in an area, is to hit, basically hit this piece of steel in an area that we're going to end up wanting to stretch, i.e. somewhere sort of not right at the edge, causing the, the edge where we want the material to shrink, to shorten, uh, to buckle. And then we flatten out the buckles in the material around the edge and that's short and they, they because the wood grips the material quite well and doesn't allow it to spread very quickly that means that the material will close onto itself and to some extent thicken it doesn't thicken that much but because you're combining it with stretching the middle as well you can actually gain shape quite rapidly so i can uh, do a very very brief demonstration i'm sorry I'm not, this is going to be pretty clumsy if you want to see this done properly watch uh, ray shaleen w-r-a-y ray shaleen s-c-h-e-l-i-n on uh, YouTube and you will see a man with much more skill than I doing this but the principles are the same basically cause tucks around the material like that and then these tucks you flatten out like so I'm not the best at it, but you can already see that the material's curling up. And as you can see already, we've already gained quite a lot of shape on that material simply by shortening these edges. Now, that would need quite a bit more work than that you can put quite a lot of shrink into a panel very, very quickly using that process. Again, rather crude. You can actually feel the heat in the material just from doing that. That's actually quite warm now. Um, now, obviously, these big hammer marks are, will have stretched these areas quite noticeably. But if this was a panel that we were making into a compound curved panel, we would then wheel that. These would all blend out into the stretched area in the middle. We would then planish these edges smooth, and that would have given us quite a big head start in the shape that we were required to put in the panel without thinning the middle down again. So I think that's a fairly reasonable summary of the principle of shrinking the edges of a panel uh, and a reasonable summary of the principle of stretching the middle of a panel. The combination of the two give us the means to create a curvature of some sort in both directions on a, on a piece of steel or aluminium or, or any other metal to be fair um, and probably a number of other materials but certainly any metal really uh, in order to make panels for a car. Obviously the skill of transferring this basic principle into actually making a panel is quite a big leap but it's if and, and that's not something I'm going to go hugely into now but the, but the principle is the thing to understand because it removes the black magic and mystery from, from the idea, from, from, the, uh, from the panel making uh, side of things. So hopefully that's given a bit of a flavor of that. As I say, the, the, uh, Jamie's got quite a few bits of video of Stu making the panels on the Churchill Jaguar, which show this in quite some detail. And he, uh, the, 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 there are various uh, uh, key attribute, key, key parts of this process demonstrated uh, through various parts that were made. The, the inner rear arches demonstrate quite a lot of shrinking because there was a huge, as I mentioned earlier, there's a huge depth to them, a huge amount of shape. Um, and so there was a lot of shrinking carried out around the edges and there was a lot of wheeling and quite a lot of hammering in the middle to just gain that large amount of crown, you know, sort, sort of four inches of crown required in that panel. Um, and then on the quarter panels, there was quite a lot of wheeling carried out to gain the, in, the initial shape and not, and not an even path of wheeling because uh, the, 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 the shape isn't even throughout the panel. The shape is more concentrated towards the top of the panel and to the rear corner of the panel. And so the wheeling was carried out unevenly through the panel to move to, to, to build the, the most shape into the areas requiring it. 
so that's shown quite well there. And then also the doors, where there's very, very little shape for the bulk of the panel. There's very, very little shape throughout it. Um, and so it's just really gentle use of the wheel to just, just introduce that small amount of crown. And it's amazing how sensitive it is possible to be with the process, just, just slightly stretching the material throughout. It's one of those things where you almost have to sort of think, real, you almost have to think you're doing nothing at all the panel you're just playing it playing it back and forth through the wheel doing nothing and after a short while of that you'll realize it is becoming very slightly crowned and so that's an area on those big doors that follow the same curvature as a mark ii jaguar door which has almost no curvature longitudinally um, it, it's actually very very tricky to get just that tiny amount of curvature and not too much getting too much is very easy to do so hopefully that's given you a little bit of a flavor of the principles that we would use to make uh, a shaped panel. The fact that we, the, the, there are only really two ways to make compound curvature in a panel, and that is to shrink it or to stretch it. Uh, and what we generally do is a combination of the two. The bulk of the shape is performed by stretching the material, but we also use shrinking in order to give us a head start with the stretching by thickening the material around the edge of the piece we're going to stretch. Uh, and we also use shrinking to shape small pieces such as window apertures, things like that. And we also use some localised stretching to shape those as well. But the general principle for making cur compound curvature panels is that combination of string shrink and stretch uh, and the principle of just thinning the material to stretch it, thickening the material to shrink it. And that's all there is to it.